in accordance with the relevant regulations. Members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity, and there is a link on the council's website for them to do so. Members of the council are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak and to switch their microphones on, uh, or, or, sorry, off once they have finished speaking. Cameras may be left on throughout the meeting if members wish, but if you experience connection or other technical issues, it may help to switch your camera off. Cameras should be switched on if and when speaking in the meeting. To indicate a wish to speak, members should use the raise hand faci uh, facility. Uh, use of the meeting chat function is exclusively for voting. At the end of the debate on each item of business, there will be a vote. Members should vote using the chat function for indicating for, against or abstain. And I will declare the results of the vote after each vote. Breaks of at least 15 minutes will be held every two hours if necessary and will be taken after a speaker in the debate has finished speaking. If we are voting, the vote will be concluded before the break is taken. Other breaks will be incorporated as appropriate. Members should be conscious that as this meeting is being live streamed, members of the press and public may be watching. So first, membership of the panel. Um, I'm Stephen Bolton. I'm the chairman of this panel and uh, member for Hatford Rural. And I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves, starting with Jonathan Kay, who is the vice chairman. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I'm Jonathan Kay and I'm the member for Way South. Thank you, Jonathan. And Annie? Can't unmute it. Yes, you're okay now. You have. You're on mute. Oh, now you're muted again. There, how's that? Yes, well done. Oh, gosh, thank you. I'm here. Thank you. Yes, and um, Annie Brewster, I am the councillor for, and I'm vice chairman of the county council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lewis? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Lewis Cocking, uh, member for Hoddesdon North. Thank you, Lewis. Peter? Thank you. I'm Peter Hebden. I'm councillor for Hatfield East. And I'm here today substituting for councillor Sue Tallon, who's unable to attend. Thank you. And Asif? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm councillor Asif Khan from North Watford. Thank you. Adam? Hello, I'm Adam Mitchell and I'm the member for Broadwater in Stevenage. Thanks, Adam. And Rena? I'm Rena Ranger. I'm the member for Rickmansworth East and Oxy Park. Thank you. And Sally? Hello, thank you. I'm Sally Symington. I am the member for Tring Division and I'm here substituting for Sandy Walkington, Councillor Sandy Walkington. Thank, thank you. you. Nigel. Hello, I'm Nigel Taylor and I'm the member for Berkhamsted. Thank you. And Paul. Thank you, Stephen. I'm Paul Zhukowski, the member for Hatfield South and I'm the lead uh, opposition spokesperson for growth and infrastructure. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we'll, we'll hear from the officers as we go along. Uh, substitutions. So we've got Sally Symington has sub substituted for Sandy Walkington and Peter Hebden for uh, Sarah Town. And apologies from the same. Now, members' interests, if you consider you have a disclosable pecuniary interest in any matter to be considered meeting, you must be, declare that interest and must not participate in or vote on that matter unless a dispensation has been granted by the Standards Committee. And if you consider you have a declarable interest uh, as defined in paragraph three, uh, 5.3 of the Code of Conduct for members in any matter to be considered the meeting, they must be declared the existence and nature of that interest. If a member has a declarable interest, they should consider whether they should participate in consideration and vote on that matter. Uh, so membership of the panel. 
to note the membership of the panel as stated above and the remit, which is as follows. Uh, you will have that in front of you. Strategic planning policy, including relationships with local planning authorities, regional and sub-regional partnerships, collaboration with all strategic partners on major regeneration schemes, development and maintenance of the county's strategic infrastructure plan, lead on infrastructure funding and planning obligation policies. The last uh, bullet point, development, management and enforcement. Paul, you wanted to say something on that. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, it, it seems to me that the way that that is specifically phrased um, leaves us open to uh, some somewhat of a problematic scenario in that we are not the um, the body that determines planning applications and therefore having uh, a remit of development management and enforcement uh, as stated in bullet point four of that remit uh, seems to me problematic because that's not actually what we what we are here to do my understanding of what we are here to do is to provide a strategic overview of policy for development management and were the bullet point to say that, I think it would be absolutely fine and would match what we're actually here to do. Uh, so I, I'd actually suggest that that we change it to to read um, strategic policy uh, oversight of, of development management or some words of that effect, um, perhaps to be agreed between yourself and the chief legal officer to make sure that it's it's compliant and actually matches what what we need it to say. Yeah, thanks, Boris. Good point. And um, I'll take that back to uh, the uh, officers and Quintin for comment on that and see where we go. OK, okay. thank, thank you. you. Uh, item two minutes. Uh, now, you are to note via the chat that the minutes of the last growth infrastructure and planning and economy panel held on the 4th of uh, February 2021 have been received. Uh, not any more than that. So would you like to just um, agree that in the chat, please. Um, my chat says that it's muted. I don't know if that's the same for everyone. I can see the chat, Adam. Maybe it's not connected properly. Yeah. OK, that's noted by everybody. Paul um, abstained because he wasn't at the last meeting. Well, that's fine. Thank you. Item three, public petitions, none received. Uh, item four, then, uh, a recovery plan and hearts let update. Um, we have a let presentation from Neil Hayes of the LEP. Neil. Thank you, Chair. Excuse me, my presentation. Just by way of background, I appreciate the, the role and the remit of this panel has changed slightly. For, for those who are familiar with the previous reincarnation of this panel, um, uh, the LEP as by myself to give a regular update on the state of the economy, um, which was uh, well received. Uh, we're happy to do that in, in future uh, meetings if uh, members see fit. Uh, also, we produce a bi-monthly bulletin on the economy as well, which I think we've in the past have circulated and again, more than happy to proceed with that. I'm going to talk a bit about where the sort of latest on the economy is and talk also a bit about the LEP review, uh, which is in train at the moment. And I think it has some bearing in terms of not only the work of the LEP, but the relationship with the panel, etc. So in terms of the, <clears throat> the labour market, which I'll focus on at the moment, uh, the charts on your left uh, are comparing half which is unemployment and employment rates uh, with the rest of the country. Um, thankfully, uh, the em employment rate um, remains high. 
significantly higher than some of the predictions we were making 12 months ago when the pandemic first hit. Um, so the overall picture is that um, we're still performing largely better than the, um, the rest of the UK economy. I think the uh, particularly of interest is the uh, the unemployment rate, which is seemingly separating more in terms of the, the, the national statistics and, and the Hertfordshire economy. And I think this is borne out by some of the other data, which I'll go through shortly. Um, I guess the only the sort of um, cloud on the horizon in relation to the, um, the overall picture of redundancies being lower than where we were expecting them to be is that where they are borne out. So if you are looking at the bottom left uh, of the screen, the the, host the sectors you would, uh, have taken the sort of the highest hit in terms of making redundancies are probably the ones which you would anticipate if you read the media or have any interest in the economy. Um, apart from uh, the last, which is professional scientific. Um, now that can cover a number of different um, roles. It's not just necessarily uh, high value manufacturing or um, scientific sort of lab technicians, etc. Um, so we're, we're still at the moment trying to get into the bottom of this particular stats, but it is of concern. And if you particularly relate to the Hertfordshire column with the England column, uh, a disproportionate amount of uh, which is usually the highest performing sector in professional scientific have been made redundant um, over the past 12 months in comparison to the England average. Um, so it's something we are trying to sort of uh, get to the bottom of. We're having further conversations with representatives in that sectors. Sometimes this can be a major employer that makes a significant change that can have a big impact on the economy, but we don't think it's that. Um, but obviously, the the challenges have been around hospitality, uh, leisure and uh, distribution, particularly around retail and to a certain degree manufacturing. Um, but again, there's nothing there which is, if anything, which uh, particularly around hospitality is not taking a, a, a significant um, hit in terms of redundancies as the, the rest of the country. But we're keeping an eye on that professional scientific um, category. Move to the next one. Um, we have on our website um, a skills and employment dashboard, uh, which has a number of different indicators, which members are more than welcome to access. If you go to the Hertfordshire LEP website, which I can provide details on, um, it can break down a number of different performance indicators into business rates and employment, break it down by um, comparison with the UK and individual uh, boroughs themselves. This one is just looking at those on out of work benefits. And again, um, disparate picture. The darker areas are those that are uh, broadly higher than normal. So if you see the average in the UK, the claimant count rate is around 6.5%. Um, in Watford, we have it 7 And also in Stevenage and Broxbourne, it's, it's slightly there or thereabouts around the UK average. But other than that, um, the, the trend has been uh, in the positive, which we are continuing to see bear out. Um, table on your right is around the coronavirus job retention scheme, so essentially the scheme that is due to end at the end of September. Uh, and I think, again, you're seeing the opening up of the economy borne out with some of the indicators coming back to us in terms of the data. So at the end of April, you can see across the county around 20% less people on coronavirus job retention scheme. So they are moving back into an employment. So that's a significant shift, uh, the biggest shift um, uh, on a monthly basis. Um, and I think that's an indication of, of things returning to normal. I think the one to, I think where we need to kind of um, keep an eye on this will be at the end of September when the scheme ends and how many of those um, will either fall to employment or unemployment. So that will really be the bellwether for how the economy is performing, um, uh, would be my judgment in that by the end of September, when this scheme um, presumably uh, uh, ends, uh, we'll, we'll get to know which of those people that are currently in employment are, have jobs to go back to or uh, are merely going to be uh, unemployed. 
Um, and again, this is showing job vacancies and postings. Again, the positive picture, if you see the, the figures for April, which are the most recent figures that we get, you know, the increase compared to previous years up 37%. So the, the column, the light blue uh, um, bar on the column is showing a significant increase. And again, this all um, compounds the, the picture that the economy is on the up, things are changing, there are still characteristics, there are still areas that we need to be mindful of. Um, but the overall uh, uh, impression we get, particularly in terms of the labor market, is very positive. Happy to pause and take any questions there if um, if of benefit, but um, if otherwise I'm be, I can move on to the uh, briefing on the LEP review. Any questions? <coughs> Chair, can I, can I ask a question about the um, unemployment rate, which um, was hovering just from 6 to 7%? Um, and then you also talked about the loss of jobs within the professional and scientific uh, area and so on. So for example, Watford has the highest unemployment rate in Hertfordshire at 7%. Is that due to that particular industry or is it uh, hospitality? Or is there a correlation between the sectors the, that have been impacted and also the unemployment rate? Um, I, I would not, I wouldn't say it's primarily due to professional scientific because all, I would argue that other parts of the county have probably more within that category. Um, but I would very much see the case if you look at what's happened in terms of leisure and hospitality and retail, which we know is significant in Watford. Um, that's where I think the significant amount of um, redundancies were taking place. So um, that's where we would normally assume it to be. Um, I also think there's there's an impact. Be the other area, the area of um, which we need to sort of understand is that we're also dealing with a highly a population that commutes so uh, you know employment changing in say London will have an impact on our obviously on our labour markets there are probably people who maybe have worked in London who no longer have roles in, in those companies that we, we are seeing um, born out in the labour market I, I think that again going back to the the job retention scheme in September that's one to keep an eye out so it's not necessarily people who are employed in Hertfordshire, it's people who, people who live in Hertfordshire are employed elsewhere, I think we're, we're most concerned with. OK, thank you. If there are no further questions, I will, I'll move on to the, uh, the LEP update. Um, I'm aware that uh, members had a, a background briefing on, on LEPs, for those that are familiar. I'm more than happy to have a separate discussion briefing for members if that if that would be uh, of use. Essentially, LEPs, local enterprise partnerships, have been uh, in play for the past 10 years. Prior to that, there were regional development agencies that covered, in our case, the east of England, to so the six counties of the east of England. And in 2010, uh, the county led on a bid to establish a local enterprise partnership. Um, they are 38 across the country, varying different shapes and sizes. So, if, uh, for example, the one to the east of us is called South East Lep, and that covers uh, a significant geography of Essex, Kent, and East Sussex. Uh, and likewise, uh, to the west, we have um, South East Midlands, which is, includes Bedfordshire, as was uh, Northamptonshire, as well as Milton Keynes, Nailsby Vale. Um, so there are there are various different uh, shapes and sizes. They have primarily been charged with delivering economic growth over the past 10 years, have a business led board with local authority representatives as well from the districts and the county. Uh, and uh, as with the change of emphasis on policy in terms of the, the current government, there is currently a process of where they are undertaking a review of the future role of LEPs. Um, Partly is that is due to roles uh, that were established by the LEP on moving elsewhere. So those familiar with funds such as the Leveling Up funds and community renewal funds, these are now allocated directly through local authority through an open bidding competition. Whereas over the past 10 years, you've had uh, the local growth fund, which the LEP has been predominantly responsible for. I think it's also useful, important to frame that the, the, the the evolution, which is how government are describing it, is to is recognise that this is not related to performance, um, and that all LEPs are currently subject to a audit uh, and um, assessment by government. 
uh, and it's it's about role change and scope. So it's underway at the moment. Uh, the form functions and geographies are the issues that are being looked at, um, but I think it's recognising the importance of relationship to local government and local business remain a sort of key uh, responsibility. Um, so in the earlier in the year in the budget, um, you may have seen a, a sort of partner document that was issued at the same time around a plan for growth. Uh, emphasis on infrastructure innovation and skills uh, and obviously you're familiar with policies around levelling up global Britain in terms of boosting international trade and net zero. But there's a kind of recognition that this happens in place. Um, I think particularly in relation to levelling up an in infrastructure that's clearly with local authorities, but there is also a dimensions around trade, international development, inward investment and developing our key growth sectors, which uh, it is still there is still a need for having some local engagement and leadership. So the, the box on the right um, yeah, where the plan for growth identifies areas that, that all places need to have some function and support around scaling up SMEs, improving supply chains, skills provision is, is, is important and obviously increasingly so over the past 18 months or so and recognising that um, economies sort of stretch beyond boundaries and often a lot of these sectors have different footprints uh, and there's a need for organisation to manage and, and, and lead on those. Um, so the, the first stage of the review is, is underway and both government and ministers and LEPs have, have, have identified four key roles. Firstly, let's, let's not forget there's, there's existing funding over the next two or three years that the LEP is responsible for, which is the ones listed uh, on the left and uh, the LEP will still be managing those funds as we move forward. And in, in Hertfordshire's case, there's a significant amount of capital funding that the LEP has managed to retain through um, uh, grant and loan payments from recycling elements of funding for certain schemes that particularly develop those of the private sector. So there's an ongoing portfolio of capital funding that Hertfordshire particularly has uh, moving forward, less so in other areas. But the other areas, which will definitely be an area of focus in the future, be around strategy, providing that evidence, that place-based expertise and that insight as to how we have a plan for growth in the locality. Previously, you may have heard of economic plans or industrial strategies. This, this was the domain of the LEP. And we have a, uh, a comprehensive evidence base, um, which we're working through increasingly in, with, with in partnership with the Growth Board over the past few years in terms of some of the work we're doing. Which I can talk a bit about. So that that role is seen as key, and all all governments recognise the importance of having an evidence base to understand how economies differ in place to place, and, and the fundamental to support bids that move forward, etc. Um, I think the one where there's, there's there's I think there's most opportunity to do more is around sector in, interventions to make them more competitive. Uh, I think there's a recognition by government that areas that have comparative advantage as they describe it need to be supportive and over the past 12 months we've been doing sector plans uh, I'll be presenting two of them this evening with the growth board around the cell and gene campus the life sciences development up in the campus in Stevenage which again is of international importance and also the creative industries in terms of the expansion of film and tv studios and the opportunities that could provide the Hertfordshire economy so I think this will be a trend that goes forward, having that more granular understanding of how those sectors work, and that would still apply for other areas such as advanced manufacturing, um, uh, environmental technologies, uh, uh, sustainable construction. So they're all particular assets that Hertfordshire have that we need to be making sure that nationally there's, there's an understanding and support. And then the other area of the LEP that has been ongoing for a few years now that, that the government think is really important, particularly as we come out of the, the current economic climate, is around business support. You may be familiar with organisations that, um, such as the Hertfordshire Growth Hub or Visit Hearts, um, a number of organisations that are associated with the LEP that deliver advice and guidance to businesses. And government are very keen that those are retained and actually built on. So, you know, at my sort of analogy in uh, with the job retention scheme, what happens in previous recessions, a lot of people sometimes you know, uh, take a redundancy and then decide to set up a business of their own. So uh, anticipating some of that over the next few months, we are boosting growth hub support, 
Um, we've also been trying to improve um, understanding of international trade post Brexit and what the opportunities are for local businesses to expand into new markets. So that whole area of business support, startup and growth, particularly picking those, picking out those companies at the high growth potential, um, which we are developing a, a program in a, with, with a range of academic partners to really provide them with a, a, a service that enables them to move on and particularly expand their businesses. That's going to be a, a key role moving forward. So in the context of, of Hertfordshire, um, I think it's probably um, it's more of an evolution of what currently exists compared to other parts of the country. So in essence, the LEP has always been business led, has always had that strategy and leadership function. We've had an existing growth hub on the same geography. I think the cluster acceleration work, um, you'll see the LEP doing more of in that space over, over the coming months. And we're having a discussion at the LEP board in July about how we can improve capacity and capability in that area. And then, uh, uh, so that will link to other government departments. I think the shift particularly is is moving towards Bayes having more of a direct relationship with LEP, whereas previously we were both Bayes and MHCLG. Um, it's clearly, I've mentioned the growth boards, there's a significant role with the LEP plays in supporting the, that role in, in driving economic growth across the county. And increasingly sub-regional bodies, so as the LEPs we work regionally both with partners across the east of England but also Catalyst South which is a grouping of six LEPs that are around London uh, and trying to work on um, working at scale or across sectors and across key uh, key issues. Um, for example the one we're looking at, at the moment is around the aviation economy and the fact that a number of our uh, towns in and around the southeast have taken a massive hit on their economies as a result of the decline in the aviation sector. Conversely, we're also looking at the creative industry sector, which is very much based around northwest London into Buckinghamshire, Hertfordshire, um, Berkshire, uh, uh, to try and impress on uh, the, the value of that sector for UK PLC. So the, there's, there's, there's different levels at which the LEP will be working at, uh, both at a very local level and also more regionally. I think going forward and then the other functions there will be an element of focus on you know commissioned work uh, we are continuing to to man to manage funding projects and processes we've recently managed the community renewal fund process on behalf of the county council um, to help them determine and prioritize schemes for support uh, and and in many cases we will also be delivering projects and schemes as and when uh, and bidding in for funds probably moving forward um, so just to finish, in terms of where we are, the process is going through at the moment. I, I'm aware that um, authorities uh, have been consulted uh, in, in at various regional forum, I understand, in terms of the role. There, there are ongoing discussions around geography. We're hoping that's not overly um, uh, transformational. I understand the, 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 the burning issue around geography is around where there are some LEP areas still have overlaps. This is predominantly the Midlands and the, and the government are keen to remove areas of overlap and align them with particularly around mayoral combined authority geography. So that that doesn't necessarily relate to Hertfordshire, uh, but it's one we've, we've got to be mindful of. Um, and uh, I think that the discussions are trying to accelerate so that there's some conclusion before summer recess. And at some point, the outcome of what the new the new model will look like will go into the outcome of CSR. And so we're looking we're assuming that the new sort of business model will move forward from April 2022. Um, still all to be de determined, but I think in broadly that the move away is, is from kind of capital fund management. So historically, the LEP has been associated with infrastructure schemes such as roads or town centre regeneration, etc. And more a focus on uh, attracting investment, attracting international trade uh, and boosting exports and, and business support skills and startup. Um, I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, comments, colleagues? Can't see anybody indicating. I think there's two I've seen. Ah, oh, Lewis, yes. 
Thank you, and thank you for that um, presentation, Neil. I just want to ask you a question in terms of the government's review of LEPs. What do you think, uh, in your opinion, is, is going to be the outcome of that review? Are we going to be able to keep um, a coterminous LEP boundary with Hertfordshire County Council, or, or is it likely the government's going to look to merge LEPs across the country? Um, that's a good question. Um, my feeling is if, and again, it's only on the basis of the engagement we're having through some of the working groups, is that there doesn't seem to be a great desire to, to, to tinker with the geography at this stage. I think there's a feeling as if um, that could be a massive distraction uh, in terms of where we need to be. I know there are there are areas that are, are challenged, particularly those um, stakeholders that are with, you know, I described two very large LEPs, that are with us, and I, I know you know authorities in those areas would like a similar situation that Hertfordshire has, which is a coterminous let with their um, with their authorities. Um, but I, I, I get the impression that the, the government just wants to sort out the landscape of, of overlap. Um, but um, I mean, and nothing's a given at this stage. But the the indications suggest that in terms of our geography, they are comfortable where we are. And in, in terms of context, Hertfordshire out of the 38 is around 19th in terms of size. So in terms of geographic size, we are one of the smaller ones. But in terms of the size of both the economy, which is around 40 billion, the population, we are somewhere in the middle in terms of, uh, of a economic geography as they would define it. So therefore, I wouldn't see us being examined in a great deal of scrutiny under that side. But but having said that, who knows, uh, ministers can change their views uh, somewhere down the line. Mm. OK, thank you. Uh, Sally, next. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, thank you, Neil, for your presentation. I actually have two questions, if that's OK, Chairman. Um, one is, um, Neil, you talked about infrastructure and obviously it's a really, really key part of all of this. Um, and I wanted to, to ask uh, one of the things you didn't mention in particular, which I think is going to be vital moving forward, is um, is a su ultra fast or super fast broadband. Um, and I, I wondered if you wanted to comment on where that kind of sits within um, our, our, you know, within our control as a county council to to deliver and whether it's adequate for, for your purposes moving forward. Um. That's a very, very timely question. Um, I'm about to, to make a presentation to uh, to the Hearts Growth Board this, this evening around digital uh, and broadband. Um, it's obviously, and that's borne out of the past 12 months, very critical. I think there's a, I think there was a general perception that we were very well served when actually comparing us to some of our home counties' neighbours in terms of going from super fast to ultra fast. So the kind of fibre to the premise, as it were. Um, uh, we're not as well served as some of our neighbours and we need to do a lot more work to work with the industry and accelerate um, the rollout of, of ultra fast broadband and uh, the, the presentation I'll be making this evening is basically making that, that, that point that we need to up our capacity as a county to both engage with the industry, we, we've held a number of one-to-ones with fibre providers, with mobile providers and understand what what are the barriers to growth? Some of it is perception that um, because we are as a uh, as an economy a, a a a number of small and medium sized towns as opposed to a city, it's harder for them to sort of understand the the complexities of, of working across say ten planning authorities in terms of fiber connectivity etc. So that there are they were very useful and I think there are a number of things that we could be doing as uh, as the as a as planning authorities and the LEP to come across in a more joined up way and cohesive. So that that's one. I think there's some, we are also proposing that the county establish some kind of digital board that focuses on this, top, this topic, which brings industry, brings the public sector and other players sort of have a real focus on that. The, um, particularly the infrastructure at this stage and that we are, you know, getting our fair share of funding. There are pots out there from DCMS, which other areas are accessing ahead of us. And again, it goes back into the sort of capacity issue. We need to have a resource to be able to bid in and get all those resources in order to benefit. So I think we could quite quickly uh, you know, address some of these issues, but I think it's recognising that we are doing it from a, a bit of a standing start. Um, uh, you know, and the LEP are very keen that it's not just about the infrastructure, it's about the uptake. It's about making sure that people have digital skills in order to provide the jobs for the future. 
what we want, you know, we highlighted areas where, you know, across the county there are, are more challenges in terms of unemployment. How can we help transform some of those places through prioritising digital infrastructure? How do we make digital, digital infrastructure a key component of our place shaping in town centres to make sure they're accessible and people can then have places to work from on a flexible basis? which we're hearing is really important. So there's a number of different aspects, but um, uh, your question is very valid. And I, I, I hopefully, uh, as of um, the discussion later today, we'll, be, we'll agree that at least a pathway to achieving some of those uh, ambitions around accelerating digital infrastructure. OK, thank you. If I can just come back and add, um, I, I guess you, you sort of slightly touched on one of my concerns, which is that we appear, we, we, we're sort of, on so superficially a dense, quite a dense, densely populated county, while simultaneously having quite a lot of rural areas, and those things obviously sit slightly in intention with one, well not intentional, they, they, they don't seem to be one and the same thing. But as a result of still having quite a lot of rural areas, actually those areas are not always very well served. And there are people who we are, in terms of our forward planning, trying to stop from moving around the county, um, who might work from home or be able to better if if we had the, the that, inf that particular part of infrastructure. Um, yeah. So I, I guess that's my observation. And if you can press uh, you know, if you're in a position to to move that forward, that would be great. Um, I don't, I, as I said, I, I just wanted to add that as my own observation. Cher, can I ask my second question? Would you like me to wait for the others? No, you can ask your second question. Thank you. Um, it's, it's it's actually a question about governance. If I would just like it, Neil, if you could talk a bit about the governance of the of the of the LEP and where the county sits in that, and which other stakeholders have a say in the governance of 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 the LEP. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the LEP in organisational form is an uh, independent company, company limited by guarantee, as all LEPs have had to be uh, put in place. But essentially that, that's a zero accounts incorporation. It's incorporation um, for uniformity of form uh, for government. All LEPs have an accountable body, which in our case is the County Council. So all our funding goes through the County Council and is subject to County Council rules and scrutiny. Um, so, and we have what's called an annual assurance framework, um, which is a kind of an operating manual between ourselves, which is a, an agreement between ourselves, the accountable body and the LEP in terms of how the governance of the organisation should operate. Um, in terms of the board, um, we have a board comprising of a business chair. Uh, we have business leaders from some of our key employers in the county. We have two SME representatives. We have a not for prop, not for profit, sorry, representative. We have two representatives from HE and FE, which obviously is the university, but uh, can also include on a rotating basis academic institutions or one of the four FE colleges. Um, and we have, in terms of local authority representation, we have the leader of the county council. And then we have three representatives from the districts, which is organised through the Hearts Leaders Group. So they will determine who the three representatives are. And I think there's a kind of two year term, which then gets either renewed or revolved round to a, to another organisation. Um, so that that that's the, that's the general governance. So um, uh, it, essentially, we're still subject to public scrutiny. So any funds that we have are, are, are subject to that, but also subject to government scrutiny being uh, you know, a direct recipient of government funding. Um, that governance may change in the future. So, for example, if we're not uh, if we're not responsible for big capital programmes, for example, they may look to a more lighter touch governance model um, um, because it is it, one of the downsides of having that huge assurance framework is you know, you're, sometimes your ability to move quickly and respond to changes to the economy very quickly is, is a bit hampered if I'm totally honest with you so I think um, and I think that's come out in in the review that if, if LEPs are going to be um, have still have a budget but be more say revenue budget than capital budget and focused on supporting business and growth they need to be a bit more agile and therefore the governance needs to be, needs to reflect that. Um, and I think there's also a keenness from, from the government to have more business uh, leaders engaged with the LEP moving forward. We have a number of sub, sub boards and I think I think the briefing that um, was forwarded on by Colin to yourself sort of articulates all of that. So I'm happy to talk about that. But we, we have thematic boards. We also have a programme management committee 
which the uh, the section 151 office from the county sits on so there are a number of different thematic and or, or organizational structures that sit underneath the let um, and then again that model is is signed off with government and with the accountable body okay thank you very much i, I guess my this i seem to be very echoey i'm really sorry um my only comment would be, and, and I, I guess if you're moving to, a, as you described, a revenue based rather than capital based, is that your current structure, which you've described as being not very agile, and I, I get that, but it's also quite far removed from the resident. So you have quite a lot of ex office, effectively ex officio um, people and the actual number of rep elected representatives on it is, is quite small. That, and, but if you're if you're if you're moving away from how as I said, from capital to to revenue, and you're also um, simultaneously trying to be much more agile. I, I can understand that possibly we're in a in a situation of flux, but um, it's it's really interesting to hear. And thank thank you very much for the explanation. Okay, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Next, yeah, just a minor query, Neil, uh, because there are a number of new people on uh, this panel. Um, you refer to Bayes. Uh, that is presumably Department for Business, Innovation business, and Skills. Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Oh, right. uh, uh, having, having said that, the, the, the policy around industrial strategy, which was more of a product of the Theresa May administration, has kind of been halted essentially. So what you're hearing now in terms of levelling up and the plan for growth, um, it wouldn't actually surprise me if the, the, the department was renamed as a result of that, to be honest with you. Um, so they're just again, as some of you will be familiar, there'll be there is a levelling up white paper due at the end of the year, which touches on areas such as sort of devolution and kind of growth and policy. So I imagine part of the the need for this LEP review is is a component of that wider policy on levelling up growth. Um, I guess the challenge, which I didn't allude to, you know, regardless of you know what version of a LEP you have in in the county is you know, the, the wider challenges of levelling up, quite frankly, and the fact that you know the LEP had oversight of around £300 million worth of funding over the past 10 years. I think we'd be looking to have anywhere near that collectively now coming into the county with the agenda focusing on kind of levelling up. I'm not, you know, I'm not making a comment or a political point on that at all. It, it, it's just a recognition that the policy has shifted very much towards supporting um, uh, other, other parts of the country. And I think we need, which is why we are increasingly working more in partnership with our neighbouring uh, organisations across the southeast, because we have problems. We have, as some of those stats have indicated, we have significant unemployment. We've got skills issues. We have parts of our county are as deprived as anywhere else in the country. And we need to make sure that that is not um, overlooked when that policy moves forward. Thanks very much. Thank you. Any? That's it. No. Gone mute again. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Is that it? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I hear me, can you? Well, mine sh yes, it's showing can. that it's muted. Right, it's something no, very it's strong. We can hear you. I'm sorry, my machine is really playing up, but Neil, it's lovely to see you, and um, thank you for all the great. It's got muted. It's muted again. Perhaps, uh, perhaps if you can put the question in chat, might be, might be more helpful. I can respond accordingly. My machine is playing up, so I don't whether you heard. Lovely to see you, Neil. Um, just uh, review and change is always concern for Hertfordshire, obviously. I'm just a bit concerned that it's not going to go the way that, that oh, it's not going to work. Sorry. Yeah, that we're not going to go the way the Heart Sports Partnership has gone, where um, it's gone to the point where they almost have to look at grants, see what they're actually pertinent to and then almost go out to fund those projects rather than seeing 
what is right for Hertfordshire and finding the funding that will fit that. So I'm a bit worried if that's going to go in that direction because we really should be doing it the other way around. Thank you. I think it's a valid point. I, I think one of the benefits of the LEP over the past two years was the ability to kind of bend and blend the pots that, that had access to numbers of different funding pots and then and then the ability to kind of use one to offset the other and get a critical mass. So a, a good example is a growth hub, which we started without before there was any initiation around growth hubs as a network across the country. So we've done also done recently with HOP, which I, I you know, welcome members to review, which is the Hop to Opportunities Portal, which is looking at skills opportunities for young people. It brings together advice for parents, for teachers, for employers and that can post job postings, etc. And again, that's a model which is now being copied by other LEP areas across the country. Um, my fear with kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with with having less. I mean, Hertfordshire, we're used to you know being being entrepreneurial with the resources that we have. You know, that's not that's not a bad discipline. I think it, my my fear is it's a critical mass. We still need critical mass of a of a functional organisation to have impact. Uh, and if it's salami sliced too much, then what my what are, you know what what businesses won't be doing is um, engaging. So if they don't feel that they can have an impact to uh, people who sit on my board from Warners or GSK, et cetera, if they don't feel like the LEP can still have an impact on the local economy, then quite frankly, why why would they sort of uh, stick around? So that 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 is a concern, but I, I'm the, the mood music thus far has been has been positive. This is not about widespread root and branch review, it's about refocusing. So um, I'm I'm optimistic that that will still be uh, we'll still be able to do things of, of significant impact. I, I, conversely, I also think you know some of the work that was fun, some of the funding pots that were funneled through us, you know, such as bypasses and housing and highway schemes. There's no argument to say, well, actually, were they core to what you know, you know, particularly businesses were 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 keen to support. So you know, there's no argument to say, well, actually, they're probably best sat with local authorities. I think the question would be, well, how does how does the local authority make sure that businesses are engaged in the dialogue, and that's where we can still play a role. So, you know, some of it I can understand the logic. Thank of, you. Uh, okay, thank you, um, thank you, Neil. Uh, there are no other questions in the chat, so members are asked to note the presentation in the chat line if you would like to do so, please. OK, thank you. That's certainly majority have noted the chat. So thank you, Neil. And um, we will move on to item five, which is the developer contribution guidance replacement for the Hartshire toolkit. And uh, Sarah's going to take us through this. Afternoon, thank you. Um, I'm Sarah McLaughlin, head of the growth and infrastructure unit at the County Council. Item five report covers the latest position on the guide for developer infrastructure contributions. This is a piece of work completed in collaboration with the various internal services we represent, and each service area has developed the technical appendices to be folded into this wider piece of work. I have a colleague, Roger Flowerday, uh, attending with me today to support on transport matters if any specific questions arise as we go through the presentation today. You may be aware we presented to panel in 2019 and then earlier this year back to panel seeking endorsement to consult on an updated version of the replacement toolkit. Following those two consultations, officers have reviewed comments made and have progressed work to support a final position on behalf of the County Council. We're now presented an updated version of the guide for endorsement and then hopefully onto Cabinet for approval in July to use the suite of documents to support our approach to how we seek financial contributions uh, from the development process. The main comments to both of the public consultations we undertook were broadly similar. Numerous comments have been raised and key points are outlined as summaries within the statement of consultation, which is an appendix uh, to the paper. Uh, copies of the full representations made are available on request. There are challenges made in the consultation responses, but various officer teams have been involved in a review of them and officers are content that the version presented today is robust and defensible. 
The scale of the proposed cost increase was one of the key concerns, particularly from our LPA partners, but this partly reflects the time period since the original toolkit was adopted in 2008. Costs and demographics have changed in that intervening period. We did undertake high level viability work, which you might recall um, to demonstrate there is headroom in particularly Hertfordshire greenfield sites, but recognise that not all sites are the same and there may be viability challenges on specific sites. Brownfield sites, for instance, may have significant abnormal costs associated with them to clear them of contamination, for example. The use of a complex demographic model was also the subject of consultation responses. Originally based on census-based data, this work has been supplemented by a detailed pupil yield survey for education planning purposes, and that subsequent work has been widely well received. An online version of the model will also be made available this summer. Ultimately, however, the guide is not planning policy, and of course it will be our local planning authorities that determine how much weight to afford the guide in their deliberation on planning applications and as part of their decision making process. This is a document that outlines the Hertfordshire approach and evidence. It will be up to our partner authorities to debate the balance of funding alongside other matters such as the delivery of affordable housing. The guide is flexible for all our services in that we can seek on their behalf if the evidence is available to do so. It simply provides an indication of the likely contributions we might seek. Each site must be considered on a site-by-site -site basis, considering local capacity for county council infrastructure. Where there is capacity for a particular service, for example, we would not intend to seek obligations. Officers must then assess the projects identified to increase and improve capacity where it's required and determine the appropriate project cost against which to seek contributions. Our requests are put forward to our local planning authority partners for them to consider alongside other requests. Where a community infrastructure levy is adopted by a local authority, that would be the main mechanism for securing obligations, unless there are any local exemptions, which might often be the case for strategic sites, for example. So just to reiterate that the guide is not mandatory, it provides the background evidence to support where we might seek and an outline of our processes so that LPAs and developers know who and when to contact. Obviously, we're mindful that the government has published the white paper, um, but as we do not yet have a fixed timeline for when the mechanisms for developer contributions might change, officers recommend that the County Council proceed to update its position to support officers in those discussions in the meantime. The evidence might also support future work if we need to demonstrate demand for Hertfordshire services as part of any new national levy approach. It's intended the guide will be assessed annually and adjusted to keep it relevant. If significant changes are required, we will report back to panel and cabinet. And this might include any changes that result from potential planning reforms once we're able to assess their impact. So we are inviting panel members to recommend to cabinet that it approve the final version. It's also requested that delegated authority is provided to the executive member for the growth and infrastructure planning panel and the director for environment and infrastructure in coordination with the relevant executive member and director for an individual service area for the appendices for each service area. This enables us to ensure that we can keep the guide up to date relatively quickly to reflect changes, for example, to Department for Education costs for school places, as an example. Uh, thank you. Uh, happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you, um, Sarah. Uh, a very substantial piece of work, this. And as it says, it is a guide for local planning authorities. Uh, it is not definitive, but it's something we would certainly expect them to follow where they can. Paul, you have your hand up. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm afraid that uh, we're not going to be able to, I'm certainly not going to be able to support this uh, paper as it's presented. Um, and the primary uh, reason is uh, contained in one of the appendices on page 80, um, where the developer contributions for education are uh, not only tiered by uh, dwelling uh, bed bedroom numbers, but also by tenure. Um, and it's split down into uh, two forms of tenure, namely market value tenure and social rent tenure. Now, uh, there's two aspects to why I don't think that that's an appropriate approach to take. The first is 
uh, that uh, differentiating between the different types of tenure um, uh, unnecessarily, the way the numbers are actually structured in the in the table, um, unnecessarily, in my view, unnecessarily penalises um, developers who are um, not only policy compliant, but may look to go beyond policy uh, compliance levels of uh, social rented housing. And I give you as an example, well in Hatfield Local Authority, which um, about uh, three or four years ago, built the first set of uh, council flats uh, in 30 years. Now, were that uh, development to come forward under the guidance, under the outlines that have been produced here, every single property in that would be paying more than double a market value um, uh, obligation to the county council. It seems to me to very much unfairly penalise local authorities who are looking to develop council housing. Um, and I don't think that as a responsible authority, Hertfordshire should be proposing to penalise uh, developers who go beyond the uh, policy requirements of, of affordable and social, particularly social rent housing. There is some uh, lack of clarity about what was meant by social rent, but I think um, it is quite clear that um, what is normally categorised as affordable housing is not what is meant by social rent housing in this context. Um, and were it to be affordable housing and a an expectation that a development would be policy compliant in that area, I would have somewhat less of a problem with it. Uh, but because it specifically outlines social rent, um, uh, it, it goes for me beyond the pale and I, I can't support that. The other aspect uh, that I would point out as a fundamental failing is the use of tenure as a uh, as a delineating uh, characteristic of what the obligation is. Um, and I'll point out to the chair who will be very well aware that in Welling Hatfield, the local council has a policy of buying properties on the open market to turn into council houses. Now, what that means is that a developer could pay the market value obligation. The council then purchase that property after the obligation has been paid. The developer avoids the obligation and the council gets the property, uh, but you still get the pupil yield. That would shortchange the county council in terms of an education um, obligation. Now, that the reason, the fundamental issue there is that tenure is a movable feast, okay? Once you have built a property, what tenure that property has is uncertain until the people move in. And even at that point, they can sell it and the tenure can change. So it's not a fixed characteristic of a development. For me, we should be putting planning obligations based on unchangeable, relatively unchangeable characteristics of a development. That is bedroom size of the properties within it and potentially location. I note within some of the discussions around uh, the obligations within the consultation responses that the County Council is looking to move towards a structure where it would define a uh, development as you know, urban high density and would have one particular uh, set of obligations for that uh, scenario and rural low density and a different characteristic and potentially a spectrum in between. Those are characteristics of a development that are not easily changeable, whether it's a rural or an urban and setting and what type and structure of development, low or high density it is. Those are the kind of things I, I believe we should be basing our obligation structure on, not tenure, because tenure can change. And I think based on what I've said there, I'm not going to be able to support the uh, paper as put to this to this meeting. OK, thank you. Sarah, would you like to come back on that? Yeah, um, I think it's a very pertinent point and very relevant and will be a concern to our local planning authorities. Um, you'll probably be aware that education contributions, probably our most significant financial contribution currently represented in the guide on a per unit basis, um, albeit that the combination of on and off site contributions for highways matters will probably also be fairly significant when reviewed collectively. 
And certainly the representations that we've had on the guide are heavily weighted towards education matters. Um, education data is extremely detailed at Hearts County Council because we've embarked upon the pupil yield study to support the approach. Um, we've been discussing emerging work by the Department for Education and we're aware that they intend to develop a national methodology, but their work has slowed due to the pandemic. Our work's continued in the background. Uh, we anticipate that the evidence we present is robust in this area um, and we are expecting the DfE to acknowledge that housing tenure has a significant impact on yields um, and as such we've used data available to distinguish between market value and needs assessed housing. It's referred to as social rent in the guide but in effect we mean, social, uh, we mean um, needs assessed housing um, because our data enables us to do that. Um, in response to the consultation, the DfE did note that the work by Hearts County Council might be regarded as best practice and will continue to engage with them as they develop their work further. Um, happy, obviously, to provide more detailed data and information on this work via a separate briefing if that would be helpful. Um, the impact of needs assessed housing has a significant impact given the project costs associated for education. You quite rightly note the start variation in the indicative tables that are provided as part of the work. Um, the amount of social rent housing does vary between applications. Um, there's no standard um, needs assessed policies necessarily countywide. Um, at the point of consultation, it's intended that county council officers can review any specific mix put forward and respond accordingly. But it is going to be difficult for our LPAs. It's increasingly challenging to secure financial obligations. Um, we'll aim to provide support wherever possible. Since the last NPPF changes in 2019, government places quite a bit of emphasis on front loading local plans with data. So we'd intend to feed this information into the new wave of local plans and ensure that our needs are considered at the very earliest stage of the process. Um, but as I said, happy to provide a more detailed data and briefing um, separately if that would be helpful. Okay. Can, I, can I respond? I mean, yes. uh, as, as I said, uh, I think the, the issue that um, you haven't fully addressed is the idea that tenure is, is not a fixed characteristic of a, of a development and actually it can change. And um, we're an approach to be taken that said, well, uh, you know, the local, um, the, 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 the LPA's uh, policy requirements is 30% affordable uh, across a, any particular development. Um, therefore, what we will do is assume that there is a 30% affordable and we will charge accordingly based on bedroom size across the entirety of the development. Number one, it doesn't demonise social rent um, in, in financial terms. And number two, it spreads the loading across a, a number of different um, potential developments and stops the issue of changing tenure, potentially causing um, a, a disjoint between the obligations needed to deliver education and those actually received. So, I mean, I, I still take the view that actually uh, using tenure in the way that's been, been used is not appropriate in this particular context. I'm very happy to have a discussion offline with you about that, should you wish. OK, thank you, Paul. Uh, Asif, next. Um, uh, thank you uh, uh, with that. So. Um, it's just twofold. It's similar to what Paul had mentioned, and um, so I, from my perspective, the, the local guide um, should, in, in terms of developer contributions, encourage certain type of developments that we want in Hertfordshire, which are uh, important. And you know, um, as Paul mentioned earlier, they, they, it's sort of skewed towards uh, private rather than social and affordable housing and it's uh, I was just looking at social housing one bedroom flats uh, it's probably lo less than private uh, uh, housing and so on so it just seems a bit skewed up it had two different questions one was you know why why are these skewed in, in a certain way when they should be encouraging certain types of development that Hertfordshire residents would need and the second point is do out of the local authorities, so we've got the 10 local authorities in Hertfordshire, how many actually stick to these uh, particular, this guide that's Hertfordshire County Council? You know, is it a Bible that they use or is it something which they not really? 
Okay. If it's not really, what's the point of it? Yeah. Um, so um, the information that's provided in the technical appendices, particularly for education, uh, well, for all of them really, but education is the one that our members will be alighting on. Um, it's not so much about um, encouraging particular types of development, but this is what the data tells us about the number of children that come out of these types of units. So the pupil yield survey that we've undertaken tells us that broadly across Hertfordshire, X amount of children usually reside within a one bedroomed needs assessed property and a different number would seem to reside in market value properties. Um, so we're very much led by the data uh, it's not so much about providing a position that encourages particular types of units. This is just providing an output of what the data tells us about how many children or people reside in these properties across Hertfordshire. Um, in terms of a Bible um, or um, how it's referred to, it's non-mandatory. The districts don't have to um, adhere to it if they don't want to. Um, but it's the evidence base we would anticipate using it to support our requests. Um, it's still open to challenge and I'm sure it will be challenged um, through the application process with applicants. Uh, we have presented uh, the versions to our local planning authorities and they've had opportunities to respond. I think the main concern is around viability of sites and what it means for sites coming forward it seems to be a common um, response from our local authority partners. Um, but yeah, certainly it's not mandatory. It's just a position that would support county council officers in having evidence to back up their requests for or, or on behalf of Hertfordshire County Council Services. OK, thank you. Uh, next is Lewis. Thank you, Chairman. I've got a clarification question. Then based on the answer with that, I might have another comment. So if I go to the agenda pack, it's page 16, but it does say agenda pack 78. I just want to explain a scenario and then I just want officers to tell me whether I've interpreted the tables correctly or not. So if we look at education nursery um, and we've obviously got the first table there, which says houses and flats or so one bed house, a market uh, value housing. So a private house is going to be sold on the open market. Are we saying that we would like 300? £147 from the developer as the contribution towards that. Whereas if it was uh, a social rented housing from the, the contributions, we would only want £116. Is that's, that correct? That's so, correct. so the scenario Paul explained earlier, so if uh, a council as the local housing uh, uh, authority that had their own housing stock bought a house from a development off the open market, we would still achieve um, the higher value that we've set out here of £347. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, because that, that process sits outside of the Section 106 process. So yeah, that is correct. So we are actually requiring less for the social houses because they're making a contribution in terms of selling that house to either a housing association or a local authority at a lesser lesser than market rate and we require houses that are being sold on the open market where developers are making a huge profit um, a higher contribution to uh, services whether that be educational or health throughout the county no so the the tables reflect what the data tells us about the number of um those age groups that reside in particular properties at the point in time that we've done the pupil yield survey. So it's that's the only thing it's looking at. It's looking at the, the number of um, children in the PYS survey, the yeah. pupil yield survey, and then the cost per place and multiplying accordingly. There's no other element that factors into the methodology and calculation. So in some instances, it might because I suppose if you were looking at houses on the uh, open market, you might, for instance, expect a couple to live in a three bedroomed house. Um, but you might, well, you shouldn't have a couple um, living in a needs assessed three bedroomed house because they would predominantly be using one bedroom flats, as an example. Yeah. So um, in, in effect, um, we're suggesting that the uh, numbers that we're securing just reflect the children that we have recorded in those particular types of unit. Um, nothing more than that, actually. Brilliant. No, thank you. That clarifies it for me. Thank you, Sarah. OK. OK, uh, no more questions. So the um, recommendation is that the panel is invited to recommend to Cabinet that it approve the final version of the guide um, and the legal pack. 
and the panel is also invited to recommend to Cabinet that it agree the appendices and technical appendices of the guide and that they can be amended under delegated authority by the exec member for growth uh, and in respect of technical appendices alongside the executive member and director or equivalent of the respective county council service departments. Uh, would you therefore vote either for or against in the chat, please? Okay, that is carried. Thank you. All right, item six is the local and joint strategic plans engagement document and it's Sarah again. Thank you. Uh, this document is intended to sit alongside the guide um, that we've just presented. Whilst the guide outlines our position in terms of the town planning decision taking process, this document outlines our approach to the plan making process. Um, originally endorsed in 2019, this presents an update which reflects work undertaken by our service areas since to update their approach or background evidence. It also incorporates new units such as the new Hertfordshire Sustainability Team. The document is intended simply to provide a process note for our local authority partners so that at each stage of their local plan development, we can communicate what we would expect to see from them and what they should expect from us. Effectively, more detail is provided as we move through the process together. The key message is that we hope uh, our partners uh, and we would encourage them to maintain early and ongoing engagement with us to remove or at least limit the amount of disagreement with the growth scenarios they outline within their plan. We cannot obviously promise that we will always agree on matters related to the development of local plans, but we hope we can limit the impact of any disagreement and work to a mutually beneficial position prior to any examination in public. We obviously want to work with our local authority partners together and help them to progress to an adopted plan position as soon as reasonably practical. Obviously, we need to review this engagement document again once the white paper proposals are further advanced, but I hope this is a helpful and complementary update with the developer contributions guide sitting alongside it. We will now, now, no doubt need to review the document as the planning reforms come through and we may need to bring more substantial changes to the panel once we have more information on those. Um, we're currently awaiting a schedule of new meetings for the Hertfordshire Infrastructure Planning Partnership, but do intend to report back through those, through those meetings as soon as we're able. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Questions on this? Rina. Thank you. Just on this and the previous one, and perhaps I should have asked before, will we be keeping some kind of note or log to see how many times uh, the, you know, these advisory documents, but I don't know if you can hear me, you're struggling, um, how fine. many that, that the local authorities are using our guidance or adhering to our ways of uh, um, recommended working? Will we be having some kind of note or report at a certain point in time to see how it's all gone and maybe what the challenges have been? for those who haven't or for those who just have not? Yep, certainly we can provide um, panel with updates as we progress through um, the programme of local plans across Hertfordshire. We have um, as regular meetings as our local authority partners want in terms of um, helping and engaging on their local plan work. Um, Hertfordshire County Council officers are available to attend meetings as and when required, um, the earlier the better as far as we're concerned. 
Um, but certainly we can provide uh, panel update papers uh, to future meetings if that's uh, if that's helpful. Yes, I think even with the engagement or how many requests you've had and how many we've managed to. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Paul. Um, right, thank you, Stephen. Um, I just wanted to uh, take uh, people to agenda pack page two seven six, um, which is actually appendix four of um, the um, the guide. Um, the really interesting, well, I think it's really quite interesting when you start reading what that says, because what it suggests is that in terms of school place planning. Um, and planning for how many schools we will require from developments within local plans uh, that will have a series of uh, tiered ratios um, without any reference to tenure. But we've just heard a discussion that uh, suggests that tenure is a really critical component of how many people we should be planning for. So I think there's a bit of a disjoint between this particular paper and the one we were just talking about in terms of school place planning. And I'd like um, a, a comment and, and a, perhaps an explanation as to why there seems to be a disjoint between the two. Okay. So the, the approach to local plans is a very high level approach um, meant to cover a broad range of scenarios across the county. Um, the PYS work we've done enabled us to group certain categories of development for local plan purposes to make sure that we had the amount of land we might need to develop the maximum amount of schools that we might need to come forward through a local plan process. When you get to the detail of a planning application and in order to meet the three tests uh, for section 106 we're required to be um, much more detailed about the requirements in a section 106 agreement which is why we have unit uh, size and tenure approaches uh, at the planning application stage as well. Does that help? Uh, um, it, uh, yes and no. Um, it, certainly when it comes to, so it is the is the document that I'm looking at in page 276 purely um, assessing um, uh, land required in major developments um in a local plan rather than the uh number and size of the schools that will actually be needed once a planning application comes forward well it is it's both really um you have you, we, we need to make sure we've got enough land to deliver the schools and at the point yeah. at which and at that point at a local plan stage we might not necessarily have all the information on the number of bedroom units for instance in a particular development size so the local plan approach is very broad brush. When the applications actually come in, we have more of an indication of whether they're uh, one bed flats, two bed, three bed, or one, two, three bed houses, and the mix of ten years, which enables us to give a more finessed answer at the planning application stage. Yeah, but if we're talking about sort of major developments that we're talking about uh, within a local plan, um, we'll have, for example, indi indicative dwellings per hectare, uh, so we'll have some sort of idea how many dwellings there are there. Um, typically, a developer will have uh, a guideline or an outline master plan to say what sort of um, uh, structure we'll have. We'll have um, information about uh, what the um, policy on affordable homes is, so what the uh, tenure mix is supposed to be within that development. And we'll have actually, I would suggest, quite a good uh, amount of information that might be able to direct us more appropriately to to a number um, as you proposed in the earlier paper. So if it's good enough for the earlier paper, why is it not in here? I don't quite understand the disjoint. I think it's, it's to do with the, the tests that we have to meet for Section 106. It's not the same level of test at the local plan stage that we have at the Section 106 stage. Mm. OK. All right. Thank you. Thank you. No other questions. OK, the um, recommendation is that we note the revised document for use by the County Council on the preparation of the local and joint strategic plans with the country's 10 local planning authorities. Would you uh, vote for that, please, in the chat?
OK, that item is noted. Thank you. Uh, item seven is the motion to write to the local MPs in respect to the Queen's speech and planning white paper. And I think Colin is going to take us through this. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Colin Haig, Assistant Director of Growth and Place. Um, yes, as you can see, there was a motion put forward that went to County Council meeting on the 25th of May, and that is the uh, suggestion that the executive member writes to local MPs to reiterate previously expressed concerns about the planning white paper, particularly in terms of public participation, accountability for decision making, uh, the provision of funded levels of infrastructure and tackling climate change. Uh, and uh, the recommendation is that on this occasion there is merit in the executive member writing to local MPs so that when the planning bill appears expected to be in the autumn, um, although you may have seen a debate about it in the, the newspapers and the media over the weekend, that local MPs have our views in order to take them into parliamentary debates. So, in essence, that is the paper, Chair. Thank you. Um, I don't intend to write to prime uh, to ministers or the prime minister every month. Um, I might do one a year, but if you really want me to do this this time, then I'm happy to do so. But questions and comments, members. Paul. Uh. Thank you. I, I, I understood that um, uh, Steve Jarvis, who originally put, proposed this um, uh, paper to full council, was he, was intending to attend? Uh, has he has he not um, arrived? Not sure. I'm here. Oh, yeah. Right. I'm okay. Here. <laughs> um, I'll I'll, uh, I'll leave it to Steve then, because I, I think there's a, a question he's got around the the the, um, the paper as presented. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I mean I think we're all well versed with the uh, the issues surrounding the planning white paper, so I'm not going to repeat those. Uh, and, and I think it is important that we make sure that uh, that MPs are aware of the the detailed um, concerns that the county council expressed in response to the consultation. Um, so I'm very pleased that the recommendation is uh, it uh, that we should write to the MPs and, and tell them about that. There was one other part of the motion, uh, and, I, and I accept that there may need to be some amendment to the way in which that's dealt with, um, which was calling for an assessment of the impact of the proposals in terms of the County Council's ability to deliver the infrastructure uh, that is required by its growth. Uh, and, and whilst I accept that we're not entirely sure what the planning bill will say, I do think that once we are, it's important that we're able to provide MPs with that kind of specific knowledge about what the impact will be on growth in Hertfordshire. Um, so I, I would be content to see that done once the bill is published. Uh, if the bill is published, you know, it's possible from what we've heard over the last few days that the bill may be being thread, fed through the shredder even as we speak. But assuming it is published, I think we need to be able to equip our MPs with the, the more detailed information about the impact of these proposed changes upon growth in Hertfordshire. So you know, the motion, I think, called for uh, officers to assess and provide a report on the impact of the proposals. I, so I think it would be reasonable to do that once the bill is published and we know which of the proposals are actually taken forward. But I think that's something that is important if we're going to make a good case about the impact that it will have on Hertfordshire. Okay, I think, uh, all right, I'll, I'll hear what Asif has to say first. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's it. Um, I, I think it's important that you do uh, write on behalf of the County Council. These concerns, I think, are held cross party, uh, especially the local plan and the, the proposals. And just to put these views, um, you know, there are certain issues which sometimes are cross party. Adult social care is another area where there's been cross party concern about this. And I think it's, I think it's important uh, from Hertfordshire's perspective but you do write to the MPs about the concerns that are regarding this uh, um, proposed um, proposal and just to show that there are, there are views and those views and concerns are held. So that's my view and I, I would encourage you to write. OK, thank you. Uh, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I, I do think that on the whole, 
this um, particular uh, letter to go to MPs might have more strength coming from a district or borough council because they are the main planning authorities, uh, whereas we only, you know, in the end, put forward, uh, well, I don't know, 120 projects a year. But I, I generally support the, the thrust of what it's trying to say. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I expect the uh, local planning authorities will be writing their own letters. Yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, Paul. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Stephen. I, I think you took the words out of my mouth, actually, there. I, I suspect the uh, local authorities will be. Um, but just, just in, in response further, actually, I think we ought to be writing as the highway authority, because it's highway infrastructure and other uh, infrastructure like that that will be um, potentially most significantly impacted by um, the levels of growth that, that have been um, suggested. Um, so I think as, as, a, as a, a body that has a more strategic view of the county and, and is, you know, the Transport Planning Authority, LTP4, for example, uh, you know, I, I do think we ought to be including our concerns in that, in, in terms of uh, what the, um, the planning paper might, uh, might contain. So I just wanted to um, uh, put, put that point across as well, that I think it's important that um, the, the suite of the family of local government um, voice their concerns. OK, thank you. Um, Colin, presumably we could talk to uh, the highways um, uh, exec and see if he wants to include um, uh, comments from highways in the letter as well. Yeah, certainly. I imagine our comments to the, the white paper would have included highways where it relates to planning aspects and securing Section 106 agreements. Just to reassure councillors in terms of what's been said, one, we're looking to bring some reports on infrastructure and funding uh, to this panel in the autumn. So you'll receive some more information about that that will tell you the story at the moment. And secondly, absolutely, we will be keeping an eye on the planning bill when it appears to understand and interpret it and make sure that you're aware and um, if we need to to engage with our MPs to make sure our thoughts are taken into account, then we can do so at that point as well. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, Rima, you had your hand up and it went down again. It was just as a new member to ask some questions. I noticed at 2.2 we'd fed into the consultation and I was just wondering where the difference was perhaps in what we were planning to write and what we had fed in so that, you know, I could just understand what some change might come over the government, which it appears not to have done. Um, so we're we're writing now to give them a, a, an extra kick to see if it makes any difference. Is that right, Colin? That sounds about right. That's to remind it, local MPs of the issues that were of most concern to us, make sure they carry them into those parliamentary debates. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Peter, you had your hand up. Yes, th thank you, Stephen. Um, I don't think it does any harm to to uh, to write to uh, reinforce the support for the, uh, for the borough and district councils. Um, but I wouldn't. Well, I don't think you're going to get asked to write as many letters as uh, as Tony Kingsbury does <laughs> as uh, as leader of Wellington Hatfield. So uh, I, I think I think one more on this occasion will be uh, will, will be a, a, a good deed. Thank you, Peter. Yes, I don't think Tony will be writing as many letters from now on as it happens. Um, OK, um, on the question. Oh, sorry, Sally. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I just really wanted to uh, reinforce that. I think it's really important that that the district and the county council stands together on this. Um, and then... so, sorry, Chair, I can't hear. Can you speak up, Sally? Apologies. Oh, okay. I'll, don't worry, I'll plug in. Oh, I'll use this. Is that better? Yes. Oh, I'm not even in a very big room. Sorry, I everyone. Think it starts off softly, and as you talk, it gets louder and louder. It feels like the computer just realizes that people are talking and then allows you to. Great. Well, I'll try this method. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I guess uh, what I really wanted to say, and I know this has already been said, but to reiterate that I think it's really important that we stand side by side with the district councils as, as the county council and the impacts are slightly different, but actually they all work together 
insofar as at the district and borough council level obviously that's the local planning authority but you know we've been set minimum targets not actual targets and once you know with the, the planning white paper as it stands once these areas come out of the green belt and are designated as growth those are minimum targets and it will impact on the county council in terms of the delivery particularly of highways as paul's already mentioned but also all the other services whether it be education and adult social care and everything so i you know as i said i think it's important that we stand together um, and the impact runs across across both authorities so yeah i i, I support sending a letter and appreciate uh, chair that chairman that you're you're mindful to do this so thank you okay thank you um i think on the question of the infrastructure we will look at that later on colin so i think the letter will deal as it says in the recommendation so you have the recommendation in front of you that i will write to um the mps to reiterate the county council's concerns about the planning white paper uh, if you are content with that, would you write agree in the chat, please? Right, that's the uh, majority agreed on that. Thank you. Um, and that's it. Just to say the date of the next um, cabinet panel will be on the 7th of September because the 13th of July one has been cancelled uh, because of lack of, lack of business. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, Chair. Thank you. Well chaired for your first meeting. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very much.